Yes, sure. Um, it's now five past two, so let's kick start off our today business talk. Welcome, everybody, and good afternoon. Welcome to today's business talk. Today's one of the top experts in Thailand is going to tell us what we should know about cryptocurrency in the Thailand landscape. I am clueless when it comes to cryptocurrency, so I'm very excited about today's topic. I hope you are too. My name is Kerry. I'm from Cathay Pacific, also the Vice President of Thai Hong Kong Trade Associations, and I'll be your MC for the next hour. Before we begin, may I please ask you to ensure you're on mute and if possible, turn on your camera so we can see each other despite being in, the, in this virtual environment. There will be a Q&A session at the end. However, if you have any questions during the presentations, please feel free to type them in the chat box. On behalf of the Thai Hong Kong Trade Association, I would like to thank our guest speaker, Kun Top from BitCup for taking time from his busy schedule to join us today. I would also like to thank our co-organizers, Hong Kong Trade Development Council, Hong Kong Economic and Trade Office, and the Thai FinTech Associations for your support. To kick us off, may I please invite Mr. Peter Wong, Regional Director, Southeast Asia and South Asia of Hong Kong Trade Development Council for an opening remarks. Thank you, Kerry. Um, good afternoon. Uh, Danny, S.Y. Jirai uh, Subsi Sopa, or Kuntop. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, it is our great pleasure to organize today's business talk. Fintech and fintech related technologies have undoubtedly emerged in recent years as major disruptors as well as drivers of growth and wealth. Virtual banking and insurance, algorithmic trading, personalized wealth management, AML and KYC technology, blockchain-based trade and supply chain finance, crowdfunding, etc. These are just some of the innovations that, that are skyrocketing in receptivity and popularity, underpinning the push towards digital transformation and greater financial inclusion. Certainly, there are challenges and volatility associated with these innovations, yet it is important that business navigate these developments to strengthen their fundamentals and boost growth prospects. This is particularly relevant nowadays since COVID-19 led to or accelerated changes in business strategies and consumer behaviors that are most likely irreversible even after the pandemic. In Thailand, for example, cashless payment and other transactional solutions are rapidly rising in popularity as our interest in digital asset and cryptocurrencies. And this trend will have significant economic and social impact. We at the Hong Kong Trade Development Council has been organizing various platforms for fintechs to connect with worldwide investors and strategic partners, including the 15th annual Asian Financial Forum and the concurrent Pan-ASEAN FinTech Roundtable just this past January, which curated a series of mentoring networking as well as business and development matching arrangements for participating companies and startups. And to date, we are honored to have Kuntop with us. As many of you know, he is the Vice President of the Thai FinTech Association and founder of BigCup, Thailand's leading digital asset exchange. And I have no doubt that his sharing on Thailand's crypto ecosystem and developments will be insightful and inspiring. Last but not least, I would like to thank our friends at the Thai Hong Kong Trade Association, the Hong Kong Economic and Trade Office, as well as the Thai FinTech Association for their support. And I look forward to our continuing partnership in the coming years. So ladies and gentlemen, I wish you an enjoyable and rewarding afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. May I now please invite Mr. Lee Sun Yu, Director of Hong Kong Economic and Trade Office in Bangkok to say a few words. Dear Danny, Kenny, Jose, Kerry, Peter, Kun Jirayut, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to today's business talk organized by the Thai Hong Kong Trade Association, THKTA, with Hong Kong Economic and Trade Office, and also the Hong Kong Trade Development Council as co-organizers. 
While the COVID-19 pandemic has been adversely disrupting many industries globally, it has positively disrupted the finance center, especially in accelerating the evolution and adoption of fintech. Amongst various developments of fintech, the application and use of blockchain and cryptocurrencies are considered the most revolutionary and important. Hence, I'm very glad that today we have Kun Zitteryud with us today to share his insightful and inspiring views on the latest developments of cryptocurrency in Thailand and how enterprises can ride on the development to expand their businesses. As regards Hong Kong, being an international financial center anchoring the world and serving the mainland China, the development of fintech is always high on the government's policy agenda. In the budget speech delivered on the 23rd of February, the Financial Secretary of Hong Kong has announced a series of measures to facilitate further advancement of the fintech sector in terms of infrastructure, regulations, innovation, and talent nurturing. Some of the major policies are, firstly, the development of commercial data interchange a centralized data platform and enable more efficient financial intermediation in the banking system and enhance financial inclusion in Hong Kong. Secondly, a coordination group on implementation of fintech initiatives is set up to review and supervise our fintech development to ensure our policy and regulations are proactive enough. Thirdly, a funding of Hong Kong dollar 10 million of financial use to concept subsidy scheme to encourage fintech companies to partner with financial institutions such that they can put forth innovative and practical fintech products and services. And fourthly, a series of programs to support the development of financial and fintech talents, including qualifications framework for fintech practitioners, financial practitioners, fintech training programs, etc. Ladies and gentlemen, despite that Hong Kong is currently experiencing its hardest time in the fight against the pandemic, we have not lost sight of planning ahead for the future economic development and identifying new areas of growth. I strongly believe that the development of financial services and fintech will continue to prosper and scale new heights in Hong Kong. In the meantime, may I wish you a fruitful and rewarding webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Sanyu. Without further ado, let's welcome our guest speaker of today, Kun Jirayut Subsi Sopa, or Kun Top from Bitcoin. Kun Top has dedicated the majority of his career in the cryptocurrency and blockchain technology industry. He co-founded Coinstone.ph, Thailand's largest Bitcoin exchange, and before blockchain emerged, Kun Top worked as an investment banker, financial consultant, and central banker. He is a speaker and one of Thailand's leading Bitcoin and open blockchain experts. He holds a Master of Philosophy in Economics from the Oxford University, and now he is the founder and group CEO at BitCup Capital Group Holdings, the largest blockchain and cryptocurrency company in Thailand. He is also the executive board member and vice president, president at the Thai Fintech Associations. Please welcome Kun Top. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Curry. And uh, thank you, Thai Hong Kong Trade Association, for uh, inviting me uh, to give a talk about uh, cryptocurrency today. And a pleasure to meet uh, you all here uh, today. So uh, I have about uh, 30 to 35 minutes to give a quick overview of what cryptocurrency is and what the future would look like and maybe 10 minutes or 15 minutes of Q&A uh, for the you know open to the floor to ask any questions related um, so let's uh, let's start um, today I, I have no presentations it's going to be a, a casual talk and overview of what uh, the future is going to look like uh, I would like to share with you all that uh, at this moment uh, you know today we are already enter entering the third phase of uh, the world's development. We call it the Web3, right? Web 3.0. We have witnessed the past you know, uh, two uh, developments of, of the web already. In 1992, the year 2000, that was Web 
1.0. In the year 2000, 2010 to 2020, that's uh, what we called Web 2.0. And since last year, 2021, you know, and until 2030, that's what we are going to be witnessing the Web 3, Web 3.0. But what what are the differences between the three developments of of the webs? Web 1.0 is pretty much a a read only, uh, a one way communication uh, experience. Imagine imagine you're we are reading a newspaper, right? Uh, it's it's a it's a static page. Everyone is, is fixed already that the whole country must be reading this exactly the same page, but it's, it's just a digital newspaper, right? That's Web 1.0. It's a one-way uh, experience, one-way communication. We can't really interact. We can't really share feedback. We can only read. It's a read-only experience. That was in 1990 to 2000. Machines follows instruction. That's what it could do, right? What was needed in the initial infrastructure of web, web one. Right? We needed modem, uh, a really loud uh, device that connected your home uh, to the internet, right? That was a really old device. We had to, we needed private server to host a website, very expensive, costly, uh, high capex, opex, right? Operating cost. Then we need a big, huge computer, uh, desktop computer. That was the infrastructure that there were the infrastructure needed during web one then enter the year 2000 to 2010 to 2020 we have experienced in the last 20 years the development of web two right uh, web two is a two ways communication it's not only we can read but we can also write right? read and write user generated content we can read, we can comment, we can share feedback, we can connect. Human connections uh, across the world is getting better and better. Before we were able to connect via text. We can't really see emotion, expression or anything. It's just pure text. Then computing power doubled you know, every two years. Then we are able to connect via photos. Human con connection is getting better and better. After photos, we are able to connect via videos. Right? It's not a snapshot anymore. Uh, it's, it's still a snapshot, but at least we get to see emotions of that moment, but it's not real time. After video, we have this human new con human connection called live stream. Right? Um, but this is where the maximum limit is reached in Web2. Right? Human connection is getting better and better up to uh, live stream. Right? Um, but there's a few limitations to uh, Web2. Uh, first of all, uh, it's two dimension. Internet experience is two dimension. Steve Jobs is creating this smart device, smartphone, and it is limited the internet users to to be in a two dimension experience. And what we have witnessed in the past decade is that Facebook is getting so 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 big, so so powerful. Google is exactly the same thing, getting too big. They they own the internet already. Uh, Facebook will never share its database with Google. We will never share its database with Microsoft. Everyone has their own centralized, closed loop, closed system database, and they would abuse their own database. Uh, you know, Mark Zuckerberg got called into Congress many times for abusing the user's database, right? So we had issues with privacy. Uh, we, we had limited experience on the internet usage as a two dimension, 2D. And also, it's a closed system, right? What is what we're about to see is the arrival of Web three, where let's let's say on the top of the iceberg first. What we see is the arrival of AR, VR technology, and metaverse, right? AR is augmented reality, VR is virtual reality, and you know the metaverse world. That's what gets people excited, right? That's on the top of the iceberg. That's what everyone sees. Right. We have internet from the sky, where Google, there's this internet from the sky race between Google, they had this Google balloon project, you know, balloon that flies around the world 26 times around the world for two, and two or three months at a time to shoot the internet down from the sky. We had this, we had this internet .org from Facebook. It's a, it's a drone, right? Plane, powered, a drone powered by solar power 
to shoot internet from the sky and this Elon Musk shooting internet from the low orbit, right, satellite. So internet from the sky. And then we had, uh, we have internet of things. Devices are getting smarter and smarter, not limited to just phones, laptops, or, uh, uh, you know, phones, laptop, or smartwatch. In the future, you know, tables, chairs, doors, everything would be connected to the internet. All the devices around us would be smart because computer chip are getting, computer chips are getting smaller and smaller each year, but they're, and they're getting more and more powerful. And the cost is down, is reduced significantly. In 2009, a computer chip is costing, was costing around $20,000. Five years from 2014, it went down to $79. Or the cost is down, is, is down to 250 times in five years, right? So uh, that's on the, the technology on top of the iceberg that everyone sees. What is going to happen in the Web3 experience is that the internet would be three dimensions because we can access internet via glasses now, right? AR, VR technology. Human connections is getting better and better via text, you know, uh, photos, videos, live stream. In less than five years, we would be able to hold a gram to connect with each other. And this is not a word coming from me. It, it came from Mark Zuckerberg. He said a cons conservative estimate within less than five years, people would be able to connect via hologram, right? Last year, Facebook invested 10 billion US dollars alone for everyone to be able to, on the technologies for everyone to be able to interact with digital content, right? When they're wearing, wearing digital glass, uh, you know, AR, VR technology. And what about the technology, you know, under the iceberg, what people don't see, right? We're talking about blockchain. We're talking about cryptocurrency. We're talking about, you know, NFTs, non-fungible token. We're talking about AI, artificial intelligence, right? Database would be distributed in the next decade. It would, be, they would be kept in a decentralized manner. And there, there will be an interoperability of the database, right? And everything would work in an open system. So long story short, what is Web3? Web3 is read and write and own and open. Read, write, own, open. That's what Web3. Web1 is read only, right? Web2 is read and write, right? We can in interact with user-generated content. But for Web3, we can read, write, we can own in a decentralized manner. And we can also, it, it, everything is going to happen in an open system, a decentralized web, right? An open financial web, a value web. And internet would be three dimension right? and we can co-own the network where facebook and google cannot be too big now we can co-own a decentralized application store and we can also co-own the decentralized is owned by one company in the future we can co-own a decentralized dropbox we can co-own a decentralized facebook decentralized twitter by owning the application token or we can co-own the application store by owning you know, holding onto the to protocol token on the Ethereum blockchain, for example. What I am about to share with you today is just one technology out of all the new infrastructure of Web3, right? Uh, let's go back a bit on Web2. What are the infrastructures on Web2, right? We have, we have um, cloud computing that is replacing private server. We have 4G, broadband internet, fiber optic, replacing modem, right? Loud noise internet device. We have smartphones. We can read and write anywhere, anytime, replacing desktop computers. We have social media, which is not a static page. It's a dynamic page where, you know, those who love football, there will be football videos coming up all the time. Those who love cats, there'll be cats, cat videos coming out. Internet has different experience and dimension for different users now, dynamic, right? And what are the infrastructures, infrastructures needed for Web3? On the top of the iceberg, we're talking about AR, VR, technology, metaverse. Those are the infrastructures, right? IoT, Internet of Things, smart device, 26 billion devices would be connected to the internet in the next decade, right? Internet from the sky. Those are the top of the iceberg technology that everyone sees. What about the infrastructure needed on the, you know, underneath, underneath the iceberg? 
we're talking about blockchain, we're talking about cryptocurrency, we're talking about NFTs, we're talking about artificial intelligence, where big data, where the, the database uh, is, is kept in a decentralized manner and there's an interoperability of the database and AI would be able to you know, utilize big data to even custom, hyper-customize the experience of using the internet during uh, Web3. Uh, what about paper money, right? Uh, we can, yeah, for sure, we cannot use a paper-based form of money in the next decade when the digital economy is going to be the biggest economy in the world. From this year onwards, digital e economy would only get bigger and bigger. Physical economy is shrinking, right? We, we are seeing digital divides. Everyone is experiencing and learning about this digital divide as we speak. During the COVID pandemic, we can see this. It is acting, COVID is acting, acting as a catalyst, right? So paper will, you know, the format doesn't make sense. Well, paper format doesn't make sense where everything would be on the digital economy now, right? So money would become digital also. So today we are going to talk about cryptocurrency. It's just one infrastructure out of all uh, the package of technology that would come in the next decade. Uh, what is cryptocurrency? Right? Cryptocurrency is a decentralized right, uh, digital money. Right? The keyword from that statement is not digital money. Right? The keyword from the statement was decentralization. Because we have been using digital money for a long time. When we are wiring PayPal, uh, credits to friends, we're actually using digital money. When we are sending swords, game items to friends, we're using one form of digital money. When you're entering into your bank, mobile banking apps, and when you enter 1 million, 1 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, enter to another bank account, bank doesn't really put money in a physical bag and move them around physically, right? It's just numbers. Uh, running. But those types of digital currencies that we have been using in the last decade were centralized. Right? On the front end, customer facing part, it appears as if we're already using you know, a digital form of money. But on the back end, everything is controlled by one entity. It can be, you know, PayPal is controlled by one company, right? It can reverse transaction, it can make your account balance disappear. It can pretty much freeze your account, right? When you're using uh, bank apps, it is being controlled by, you know, Botnet, for example, in Thailand, centralized system controlled by the Bank of Thailand. So digital money in the past decade, they were able to, con you know, be, be able to control by a gaming server, a gaming company, game items, right? Or a central bank or a single private company or, or a country. Until 2008, there's this person called Satoshi Nakamoto. So we don't know who he is or is, whether it's a group of anonymous developers. Um, came up with a, a white paper called Peer-to-Peer -peer Electronic Cash System. In 2009, the application of Bitcoin uh, came out. Uh, Bitcoin became the first ever digital currency that is fully decentralized. You know, the whole uh, system is run on the blockchain, an open blockchain a public blockchain, right? And on the user front end customer facing part, it's gonna be the same user experience as using your the, the bank app, right? It's just numbers flying around, a unit of account flying around between accounts. But the difference is on the back end, it is not being controlled by one entity. Everyone, all the miners, all the validator no nodes around the world would be running the servers, running the system in tandem we call it a distributed ledger technology where there is more than one centralized ledger. There are, there are multiple, many decentralized ledgers, you know, recording transactions at the same time around the world. The more the nodes, the more stable, the more decentralized, uh, the more, uh, the less trusted uh, in, a, in an you know, entity, a single person failure, uh, is, is needed to operate the system. So what is good about cryptocurrency? What, what, why is it so destructive, right? Uh, let me share with you a quick story. Uh, about seven years ago, when I started the first company, the, first, the very first Bitcoin company, I was being uh, called in uh, for an investigation by many authorities in Thailand. 
and regulators. The anti-money laundering officers send me a letter. The Bank of Thailand send me a letter. The RD, Revenue Department, even the SEC. Uh, pretty much all the regulators in Thailand. This was eight years ago. Imagine Bitcoin eight years ago. Right? People thought it was a mon money laundering, you know, gambling, drug money, toy money. Do not go anywhere near it. There was a general public perception. I was the only one believing th in this thing. Uh, very few believing in this thing in Thailand. We had big fights in the family. Uh, I had big fights with, with my dad, especially. You know, he sent me all, all the way to top school. Uh, had high expectation of me. Uh, I ended up, you know, opening a, a company that was apparently being quoted as money laundering by the regulators. Right, so big fights. Uh, one morning, uh, one one day, uh, as a, as a, the oldest brother, uh, my my sisters and my brothers, they all went to the UK as well for universities. As an oldest brother, uh, my job was to transfer money from Thailand to the UK. That day, I had a fight with my dad, so I told my my, my dad. Uh, that day I had to transfer about 200,000 baht, like 200K to my sister, Nan, right? Her name is Nan in, in the UK. She was studying every quarter to pay for her tuition fee. Uh, I had this small shop. I, I started the first company in a small shop, clothing shop in Pratunam Center in, in Thailand. So I told, I told my dad, just transfer this 200K to my Gasigon uh, bank account and I will show you uh, I will remit money from Thailand to the UK for you. Usually I had to walk to a bank branch, right? Near the shop, near, near, the, near the clothing shop to remit money from Thailand to the UK. That day I used, I used Bitcoin to send money across to my sister. Within 30 minutes, uh, Nan, my sister, rang back to my dad and said that uh, the money already hits the bank. How come, how come I don't have to wait for two days this time? Usually it takes two days for the money to arrive from Thailand to the UK. My dad, my dad was quite surprised because, very surprised actually, because I haven't left the shop yet. Right. What is more, right? Nan said, dad, I told you to wire only 200K. Why did you wire extra money for me? Right. This time, why did you give me extra money? My dad was shocked. You know, for that, that day on that transaction, I made an extra 5% profit on that transaction for that international transfer alone. It was very unprecedented for my dad, right? Um, for the first time in human history, you are able to get money across overseas and ended up with more money. Now, if you were to use banks that day, I, I would have lost 5% transaction fees, wiring money from Thailand to the UK. I would have waited for two, two days for the money to arrive. It would be worse if I used Western Union, right? I would have lost no, no, 10 to 15, 15% transaction fee. You know that moment when, when you're exposed to automobiles, cars, you're not gonna go back and ride horses again, right? That moment exposed to um, Skype or Zoom, you're not gonna go back and pay for international phone calls again, right? Or that moment when you're exposed to emails, you we will never go back and write letters to each other, right? Exactly the same thing for me. Uh, that moment uh, on, I have never used uh, a commercial bank again. Now, it doesn't make sense in the 20th, 20th century, in the internet century where we can get messages across instantly in a frictionless global instant manner. But when we are trying to get value across, it takes two days, it takes 5% fees, it takes intermediaries to process. There are a lot of redundancy, deadweight loss, inefficiency in the ecosystem. That exact moment, you know, I was like, wow, I would never go back and use banks again. So Bitcoin is very disruptive if you know how to use it. Especially another feature that uh, traditional, traditional banks cannot do is, is micropayments. Imagine if we walk to a bank branch, any bank branch in Thailand, and you put it, you, you, you take out your uh, 100 baht note, put it on the counter and ask the teller at the counter to wire this 100 baht note overseas from Thailand to Africa, to Thailand to, to Hong Kong, Thailand to overseas, to the UK. What would the bank tell, tell you? It's not feasible because it's not economical, right? Uh, economically feasible because the international transaction cost is much higher than 100 baht fee. So micropayment can never happen with traditional banking. Right? Intermediaries fees, uh, a lot of redundancies. But 
you know, with my company, we have only been around for four years. We can allow Thai citizens to wire money from Thailand to the UK uh, within 30 seconds, instead of two days, 30 seconds. And the loss from 5% fees is down to 0.05%, 100 times, not 100%, 100 times cheaper. And we can send 10 baht, 20 baht across instantly, globally, in a frictionless manner, right? With the blockchain technology, it allows micro to happen for the first time in our history. Right? Uh, you know, one Bitcoin is around 1.3 million baht right now, but we don't have to buy one Bitcoin when we remit money overseas. We can buy 0 0.000001 Bitcoin, millibits, and we can send this millibits by moving our thumb on the phone that is connected to the internet. That's all the infrastructure we need, right? Um, it may be far fetch for for uh, for all of us here because we all have we all have bank accounts. We are all, we are we are the top one percent. We have credit cards, bank accounts, but the reality is, people in the ASEAN region, fifty percent, do not have a bank account. They don't have access to basic human rights, like bank accounts, you know, financial services. So they are being abused by Western Union, right? Loan charts, twenty percent interest per month. 15% transaction fees. You know, Filipinos, there's, they're, they're exporting laborers, right? Um, nannies, doctors, and every month, uh, you know, Filipinos would, would line up at the Western Union counter and they would wire 50% of their paychecks back home to feed their extended family. You know, Filipinos, they have to work at least 13 months per year because that, well, that, that one extra month is in Union. 10 to 15% fees. Imagine if you know, a Filipino's worker realized that he or she could do exactly the same thing with Bitcoin, but not for 15%, not for 10%, not for 5%, but for 5 cents. What is what would gonna be yeah, happening right, to the world? Right? Bitcoin is like the, the, the best technology that would have the greatest impact to the world's poorest people right now. Right? Imagine with the situation in Ukraine, in Russia, Russia right now, right, where the currency loses value very quickly. Imagine if you've been keeping uh, in, you know, money for, for your whole life, wanting to buy a house, and this event happens in one day. All you can buy, all your savings can only buy one bread instead of a house. That's a very bad experience, you know, and people can't really move their assets to start a new life. Imagine if you go to the airport, right? The soldier said, you, you can leave, but you, can, you have to leave all your assets here. You can't take it with you. There's no financial freedom here, right? There's oppression. And people in Ukraine, in Russia, with cryptocurrency, they can convert it everything, everything into Bitcoin, for example. And they can walk out that door, that airport door, with a password, in their mind and they can take all their wealth with them and start a new life right? and they can protect their wealth from hyperinflation or the currency loses value very quickly again this may seem far-fetched for, for all of us here because we, we're lucky to be here right stable country credit cards you know fi financial system but the reality is not what we we, we experience right people in i don't know venezuela people in argentina people in russia and ukraine right now they're suffering a lot and this technology is going to help exactly those in need, right? So, you know, with cryptocurrency, there are a lot more, uh, you know, potential. There, it has a lot more potential that uh, we could not do so many things with our current financial system in the past. The ability to allow capital to free flow, that's one thing, right? With a move of your thumb with your phone con that is connected to the internet. People can you know, move capital across in an instant frictionless global manner, right? Uh, we can allow micropayments for the, to happen for the first time in human history. And also it can reduce debit loss from the payment system. Imagine if we are swiping credit cards right now, or if we are doing commerce, digital commerce, commerce, digital commerce, when we are making 6% profit, we have to pay 3% uh, fees to credit card companies. And they don't really do much. They just move bits around the internet, right? The merchants, they still have to share the face, the risk of credit card fraud and chargeback risk, right? And payments don't really speak the same language. 
imagine if you want to wire money from from WeChat to PayPal to Thai banks to the UK banks to stock exchange of Thailand to super rich to money exchanger, they all have a, their closed system. You know, they, they speak different language languages, different owners. There is translation fees, inefficiency fees, right? Dead bit loss. But blockchain is an open system, right? People can, can you know you know move their capital instantly, friction in a frictionless in a, in an open manner. That's what Web3 is all about, an open financial web, right? We can not only share co or comments or ideas or feedback or text, we can also share values peer-to-peer -peer. and we can co-own, uh, you know, uh, digital assets or co-own the web uh, uh, in a decentralized way. Um, so, you know, uh, also for, for donation uh, use cases, uh, people can... Uh, use cryptocurrency to to donate uh, to those in need. Um, you know, about six or seven years ago, there's one person who went into a sports stadium, a televised sports stadium, and when the uh, camera was you know capturing him, he saw that he was he's on he's on, tele, on on the on on the TV. He showed up this big sign with the QR code and said, "Send me Bitcoin." Within 24 hours, he has received uh, almost 1 million baht from any, everyone around the world who has, he has never met before, right? On that moment where, moment where everyone was watching this televised uh, sports, uh, sports on TV, the camera was capturing at this guy. Everyone with a phone, with two clicks on the phone can wire micro payments to him via his TV screen. Right. The first button is to scan the QR code from the TV screen. The second QR, uh, the click is to send the payments. Within 30 minutes, you know, micro payments would arrive to him, uh, bypassing all the intermediaries, right, directly to his wallet address. What is happening in the donation world right now is that there is an intermediaries and there's no transparency or accountability at 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 all. Right. Imagine if there is an earthquake in Japan right now. And then we see a, a, a person crying in front of a, a TV, a Japanese TV, and, and we're in, in Bangkok, we wanted to help. What can we do, right? We can call up a, a, a Thai Red Cross and say, and say, I want to donate a thousand baht to those victims of the earthquake in Japan. Do we really know that, what, that 1,000 baht that we know donated, how many percentage went to the operating expense of that charity? And the leftovers, those leftovers, are they really wired to, to that person that we saw on TV, right? There's no transparency, no accountability. You know, next time when there's an earthquake anywhere, right? P the people, the person, the victim uh, realize that now he or she is on TV, on a you know, uh, TV, uh, public TV. He or she can just take up, take, uh, take, you know, bring up a piece of paper with a QR code and said, help me, send me Bitcoin. Right. Everyone watching the news can, with the two clicks on their phone, scan the QR code in front of a TV, in front of a laptop, in front of anything, right? Newspapers on that, scan the QR code, click send the payments, right? Uh, everyone can send micro payments to the victim within 30, 30 minutes. The money would arrive at that, at that, at that ex uh, address, address right away, bypassing all the intermediaries, middleman, uh, inefficiency. So there's full transparency and accountability, and cryptocurrency could disrupt the no donation industry going forward uh, as well. Right now, the situation in Thailand um, is uh, we are, I would say, one of the fast forward, uh, you know, uh, country in the ASEAN region. We are leading even Singapore in the digital asset space. Bitcup is one of the very first company in the world to, to be licensed, to get a, a, an official license from the Ministry of Finance uh, four years ago. One of, the, one of the very first in the world, right, that this regulation came out. Even the Bank of Thailand, they set up the uh, Internon team, uh, digital currency team in 2017. I would say in the top 10 in the world. Uh, and they're exploring now, it's the fourth, fourth devel development phase now uh, with the Bank of Thailand. They created internal project for international uh, transfer fees, B2B, between banks. 
uh, digital bonds as a second phase and the interbank transaction for domestic uh, internal tr transaction between banks with the blockchain. And right now in Q3 this year, uh, digital bar would come out in, uh, in a few months uh, this year. Um, and China, uh, they already issued uh, digital yuan, right? and it's being used in four provinces now in China. Um, so I would say we are one of the, one of the fast forward uh, thinking country in the ASEAN region. Uh, traditional financial players are jumping into, into the space. Even, even in America, four years ago in 2017, uh, when the Bitcoin hit, uh, it was a Bitcoin summer, right? the Bitcoin boom, a Bitcoin year four years ago it happens once every four years last time was in 2017 14, uh, 18. Uh, the coinbase is the largest company in america and it's a good index right uh, four years ago the 70 percent of all the volumes came from retail investors 30 percent came from institutional investors then fast forward in 2021 last year when there is another bitcoin boom right once every four years four years fast forward. Um, you know, institutional money, money, institutional money came uh, up to 70%, you know, and retail is down to 30%. So we can see a clear trend that institutional money is coming into the space now with clear regulations, uh, development of the uh, custodian infrastructure where they, they can keep their digital assets safe, right? Uh, we see all the big funds uh, investing in Coinbase as their cap table investors. Um, all the uh, biggest traditional finances are coming into the space. JP Morgan, Morgan, Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, you know, entering the space now. Um, so it's an, an exciting uh, future. And for Thailand, uh, traditional banks are setting up teams for digital currency. They're jumping into the space now. Uh, and it's one of the fastest growing industry uh, in the past four years. For uh, Bitcoin is a good good index for Thailand. Right now, we control ninety five percent market share in in the country. Um, in the last two two months, in November and December, our traffic already exceeded you know traditional stock exchange set trade in in Thailand. We have three point four million registered users, one point two million active users. Um, and Bicup is also one of the very first uh, fintech unicorns in, in the country. Um, we have 1,600 employees. We have nine, nine blockchain companies under our Bitcup holding group all within four years. Um, so, and we are building the infrastructure for Web3, right? Cryptocurrency is just one underlying uh, technology underneath the iceberg that people won't get to see, but they will be critical for the, the development of, of Web3. Imagine just if you look at the past decade web two developments what is on top the, of the iceberg that everyone sees is skype zoom gmail hotmail right emailing services um, those are the, the things that got people excited in web two but what is underneath the iceberg is what we call the uh, tcp ip protocol smtp protocol like https protocol or ssl security protocol you know, Gmail and Hotmail and Yahoo Mail cannot happen without SMTP protocol to allow people to send email in the same manner. Right? Zoom, Skype, you know, StreamYard cannot happen without TCP IP protocol underneath the iceberg. It's the same, you know, it's the same piece, but people don't really see what's underneath the iceberg. It's the same iceberg. Exactly the same thing is happening in Web3. People will be saying, talking about metaverse, meta, uh, metaverse, AR, VR technology, but metaverse cannot happen without NFTs. Imagine if we can hologram to see each other now, and there are, there are two top tier, right? you're wearing the same clothes, looking the same, looking, looking exactly the same, but who is, who is, who is authentic? Who is the real one? Right? The, only, the only way to identify the uh, real authenticity of that particular item or person is NFT technology. Right, to embed the DNA on the blockchain. So everything is happening in tandem in a package and cryptocurrency would play a big part in the development of Web3. Uh, that's, that's a quick uh, overview of uh, uh, what is going to happen and how you know, cryptocurrency can unlock 
new potential, uh, you know, uh, capability, human capabilities that we cannot do with the previous financial infrastructure. Uh, we have about uh, 10 minutes for, for the floor to ask uh, any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Kuntop. That was a very interesting and educational sharing, um, especially around the UK use cases, and also some very thought-provoking point as well. Um, clearly, there's a lot for me to learn about um, Web3 and not just cryptocurrency, but blockchain, everything else. Um, you mentioned that you know Bitcoin is very disruptive if you know how to use it. I think this is um, very spot on on our work, most of the questions. Um, most of the question our audience would like to, to know about. Um, so I'll just dive straight in. Um, is it one of the first question is, is it really that simple? Anyone can just create any coins and list on the coin exchange and just sell it without the ecosystem to support the coin circulations? Um, you know, everyone can create a coin, but it's really, the key question is the ability to attract capital, mm. right? Uh, it's the same as everyone can create a Facebook page because Facebook is, 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 a, is a generalized platform for people to create a, a page to marketing their own products or services, but it's hard to attract attention. Right? Mm. So Ethereum is a, is a generalized platform for people to create their own coin or their own decentralized applications, but the ability to attract capital, that's a different question. Right, uh, a coin without a network effect is useless. It's, it's, it, it, it is linked to another question. Why would Bitcoin has value? Or why would any cryptocurrency has value? How do we determine its value, right? The value of these protocols uh, comes from the network effect. Uh, it shares property similar to internet companies or, or a fax machine, right? We remember fax machines. Like uh, you know, uh, twenty years ago. Imagine if I am the only person in Thailand who Thailand who has a fax machine. What can mm. I What can I do with it? It's I can use it as a door stopper maybe. But <laughs> imagine if every household has a fax machine, then it's very powerful. We can we can connect, you know, for the whole the whole country together. Right? We can unite the whole country together with everyone uh, with a single fax machine in a household. The value of a fax machine is not the machine itself. It comes from the network of users. Same with Line or WhatsApp or WeChat. It's, the value doesn't come from the software. Imagine if everyone in Thailand uses Line, but I'm the only one who uses WeChat. Then when I send a message, it doesn't come back, then it's useless. I have to go back, I have to go back and use Line because all my friends, families, and customers are on Line. Right? Mm. The value yeah. of Line doesn't come from the software, but it comes from the network of users. Same with Facebook. Uh, it's an open source, right? Right now, I can go back and fork and create a top book with the blue label, white letters, exactly the same thing. But the ability to attract the network is another is a different question, right? A three point three on Facebook right now. Mm. Can you migrate half, half of the world's population to use your app, right? Uh, if I post something and nobody sees it, then I have to go back and use Facebook. Value of Facebook doesn't come from the software; it comes from the net network effects. Same with Bitcoin. If I'm the only one who can create, uh, anyone can create a, a coin, but if I, I, I can fork, go back and fork Bitcoin right now into a top coin, exactly the same property, 21 million top coin, hash function comes out every 10 minutes, cryptographic hash function comes out every 10 minutes. But I control, I own 21 million top coin. Then it's like a fax machine that I have, I'm the only one who has a fax machine, a door stopper, right? it's, it's useless. So, you know, anyone can create a coin, uh, but, the ability to attract the network effect uh, or the capital is a different question. And we have to design a very good, uh, I would say token economics or crypto economics, right? Tokenomics yeah. to attract the network of users in a decentralized way, right? We, can, we have to design the blockchain governance uh, for developers to keep developing on the same blockchain instead of forking into a different one and you know, stealing the network uh, away into a different blockchain where it's like DNA mutation, where the str strongest genes would, would survive mm. in, in the long run because yeah. everything is happening in an open system. But in Thailand, you know, everyone can create a coin, but not everyone can list on a secondary exchange. We have a listing criteria also. Mm. Uh, so if just like taking a company public, right? Not every company 
companies in Thailand can go public. There's yeah. a, a listing criteria for SET and MAI for Thailand to be listed on a stock exchange. You have to meet certain conditions, 10 yeah. say 10 conditions. For BitCup, we, we have 10 conditions created, co-created together with the Thai SEC. Mm. Um, so those coins that you know doesn't meet the criteria, then we can't really list on the secondary marketplace for everyone to buy and sell. Got it. Thank you. Um, very clear. And I think uh, given the limited time we have, I think the last question and probably the most um, interested question is, uh, can you talk, could you, uh, you are an early adopter of the, you know, believe, an uh, early believer into the cryptocurrency world eight years ago. Um, a lot of us is just a beginner uh, in beginning, beginning, starting or starting to wonder about the, the cryptocurrency, investing in it. And what are some of the tips that you will share for uh, a beginner Bitcoin or any cryptocurrency investor? Now, first of all, uh, it starts with the right education. Like we need to have a financial education. Don't, uh, you know, um, you know, follow the, the herd and see you know, you, if you see, you know, how, how is this guy getting uh, a new car next to me uh, and their neighbor, you know, uh, buying a new Mercedes and said, what does he, what do you do? And say, you know, I trade Bitcoin on BitCup and, and jump into the bandwagon right away. Don't, don't do that. Make sure uh, you understand we have the right set of education before we start. Right? We have to know how to open a, a, an account. Uh, a cryptocurrency account, how to buy, how to sell, what is limit order, what is market order, what is public key, what is private key, right? How to send, receive money, how to keep cryptocurrency safely, what is hot wallet, what is cold wallet, what is tracer, what is nano ledger, right? So, so these are all the basic educations that that I would say, uh, you know, get get ready first, right? With the right set of educations. And second of all, the readiness. The readiness of everyone is, is different. Do not follow the herd, the herding behavior. Um, do we have you know, money that we can afford to lose? Yeah, don't borrow money to speculate. Don't, don't sell your house, your car, just to speculate on, on cryptocurrency is way too risky. Anything that is up very quickly, it can go down very quickly also. Right? High risk, high return. Um, and also the seg second factor is to have the stomach to ride the volatility, very high volatility. If if we cannot sleep, if you cannot sleep well trading stocks, uh, you say move up and down ten percent per day, then don't come into the cryptocurrency world because ten, you know, twenty, thirty percent per day that's normal. That's a normal day, right? In a cryptocurrency world, very high volatility, and there is no floor, no ceiling. Uh, mm. The trading happens 24 seven, seven days a week, you know, no holidays, no, no, you know, uh, no break. So make sure we have the right stomach to ride the volatility, have the money that can, we can afford to lose. Don't use hot money that you have to use within, I don't know, the next year. Or, <laughs> yeah. um, and, and also uh, make sure you, you understand what you're investing in. Right. Like Warren say, said, investing is like a baseball game. Right? Nobody forces you to swing you know, on every ball that came, came to you, comes to you. Um, you know, nobody is putting a gun again in your head, uh, on your head and said, you have to swing every ball for, to every, at every ball that comes to you. Only swing to the ones that are, though, you, you're sure to be a home run. Right? Uh, Warren, he misses a uh, good, good opportunity Facebook is on uh, Microsoft, but you know he invested in something that he understands. Chewing mm. gum, he said. Uh, no matter how the world or how advanced the computers are, are going to be, people are still going to be chewing gums uh, the same way. You know, drink Coca Cola, Coca Cola the same way. So he invested in what he understands. Yeah. Um, there are people that that you know bankrupt, fully bankrupt in the real estate sector, fully bankrupt in the stock exchange sector fully bankrupt in the cryptocurrency space also so and there are people those who succeeded in all industries so i guess uh my advice is to invest in something that we understand don't invest in something that you don't understand yeah very good advice i think not just in crypto but uh, everything in our daily lives um okay.
time. I'm so sorry that we can answer all the questions. Um, thank you so much, Kuntof, for joining us today. And thank you so much for everybody also joining us today. And um, good luck to you all with your investment in your cryptocurrency. Um, our next business talk will be on the 4th of April. A lot of you are senior executive of your company. So um, speaker from the Baker McKenzie will share with us more about what are the liability of being a director. And in the middle of May, Lawrence and Partners Bangkok will be joining us and sharing with us the latest changes in Thai labor law and how company can avoid employment disrupt, 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 dispute in the post-pandemic world. So um, stay tuned and see you all soon. And most importantly, also stay, stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you so much, everybody. And thank you so much, Kuntop, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great week, guys. Take care. You too.